Hey, hey, everyone, it's Sleepy Reader, a.k.a. Damien. This is my comic book countdown, plus a little bit of a, a trade comic book trade haul from Drawn, Drawn and Quarterly. I'll get to that at the end. Um, I have nine comics to talk to you about, ranked super subjectively, as I always like to do, just based on my own enjoyment of them. I'm sitting in my brand new lawn chair that my lovely wife, Brought, bought me for my birthday, so uh, I'm very comfortable, even though it's still 88 degrees out in the backyard, not 102 anymore, so I should feel cool, although the, the humidity feels like it's increased a lot, which is interesting. And now I'm told soon, in another day or two, we're going to be getting smoke from the wildfires down on the California-Oregon border. So I don't know how bad that'll get, whether I'll have to stay inside, especially because of my asthma. I'm going to enjoy the backyard as much as I can. And I, I don't know, could the humidity have something to do with the forest fires? I, I don't know if that makes sense. For George, I am drinking a Yerba, Yerba Mate beverage with, uh, what, hibiscus and citrus flavors. So I think the theme of my uh, new comic book reading, the comics from Wednesday, was this week was... I wasn't paying attention enough to what I was buying, and so I, I made some mistakes, I think. Um, I, live and learn, right? <laughs> I feel like I've generally been learning for quite a while now how to get the most bang for the buck, or bang for my time, really, with reading comics. But this week it didn't work out quite so well. And I'll start by putting at number nine, Bisto Blanco. I just picked this up on a whim because it said one shot and it was from SourcePoint, so uh, SourcePoint Press, which I figured meant it would be something kind of unique. And I suppose in a way it was. It was kind of a weird outer space with super villain kind of battle and a group of superhero-ish type characters who I had no idea who they were, even though this is a one shot. But all my questions were answered when I got to the back. And it turns out there's a band called Bisto Blanco. And uh, I think they're kind of a hard rock band. That Their singer is the daughter of Alice Cooper, I believe. Anyway, so maybe this is, would be a great thing for their fans. It wasn't really for me. And so if I, if I uh, researched a little more before I bought it, I probably would have passed. Um, although I bought it at a store that wraps their comics in plastic. So you can't really flip through the comics. I mean, technically they'll let you open up the bag and take out the comic, but such a hassle, and then I'm always worried that I'll get a tape pull or something that I never do that at that store. I also, I think I had this on my pull list, Bloodthorn Lady of the Lanterns. And this was a particular mistake. It's in at number nine, sorry, at number eight, because I'm starting at number nine, the Blasto Blanco was that. This, the reason I put it on my pull list is it, it is drawn by one of my favorite artists, Peter Kowalski, if that's how you pronounce his name, Piotr Kowalski. And it also conveniently is written by Colin Bunn, which was also a positive. So whenever I see that there's a book drawn by Kowalski, I put it on my pull list. But this is based on some video game. And the story in here is so minor and just nothing that really grabbed me that I kind of felt, I don't know. I still enjoyed Pieter, Pieter Kowalski's art, but uh, I just didn't get a lot out of it. Um, so I don't, should I remove it from my pull list? I don't know. I do enjoy the art. Um, I wish Kowalski was on some big image books or something. And then I picked this up without looking at the price. This is Wild Cards, Drawing of the Cards, number one, and it cost me five bucks. And it's a 20-page comic. It has all right art in it. And it seems to be a sort of beginning for the Wild Card universe. I read a bunch of the anthologies, you know, the prose anthologies, edited by George R.R. R. Martin way back when. When was that? The mid-90s, I think, 
there was Roger Zelazny in there and a bunch of other writers, uh, Melinda Snyder, Melinda Snodgrass, sorry, um, Howard Waldrop. Had, so a bunch of uh, big name uh, science fiction writers who I was a big fan of were writing these superhero stories in an anthology, a, a braided novel, they sometimes called it, where the short stories were linked. Um, and that was really cool. And this is okay, but it just didn't have what I was hoping for. And, and I think the price really cooled my jets. So I put this in at number seven. Oblivion Trials, I knew what I was getting. Another source point book. I don't think this links up to anything else, or if it does, I haven't learned that yet. It, I could imagine it becoming a video game, but it's more like a... It's an afterlife story, but with kind of a fairy tale aspect to it, and a bit of a quest story. It's fun, not like the most advanced kind of work, but, but I enjoy it fine. Um, and I'll... It's on my pull list. I assume it won't be too long, and I'll stick with it. I really like the coloring in that one. So I put Oblivion Trial at number six. At number five, I'm putting Public Domain by Chip Zdarsky. Um, I don't know how long this series is. Do I want to drop this one? Uh, it's okay, but that's it. Um, it does stir up a lot of thoughts about the comic book industry, I'm, which I might discuss more in another video, maybe a sleepy vlog, because it <clears throat> dovetails with some other things I've been reading about or thinking about. But uh, this is not... Chip Zdarsky's not a guaranteed good read for me. <laughs> I love Newburn. I, I've enjoyed his uh, Daredevil, the parts that I've read so far. I still need to catch up on that. And uh, I haven't tried his Batman yet. Um, and I was so excited over him doing the art, but it, he's taking a very staid, careful approach to the art and not very exciting colors either. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting, but it's also like the real life stories that it's based on maybe are more interesting, or at least so far, maybe the story will build up. And as I said with the first issue, I kind of wonder if because this originally was a Substack project, it was a kind of a a uh, alternate project for him, like not a front burner, but more of a back burner project for him. Uh, we'll see. Then at number four, I'm putting the new Detective Comics. Luckily, they did not reboot, renumber, but it's new because it is the first issue pence, uh, penned or typed by uh, Ram V. Everyone's favorite younger writer in comics and I am I am gaga over this art by Raphael Albuquerque and um, Dave Stewart just they're you know Dave Stewart's not perfect for every artist but I think he's pretty perfect for um, Raphael Albuquerque and it was such a pleasure to see the two of them working together again I think I think I've read a couple of other comics where they work together at Dark Horse uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think there was one called, was it called Eight? Or something, it had a number in the name. And I think, I think that Dave Stewart was the colorist on that, too. Um, but anyway, that makes them the kind of a dream team. And it's hard to tell for sure where Ram V is going here, but it's, it's pretty promising. Do I, 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 I kind of wanted to grab this issue to be sure I, I just sort of checked it out because I wanted to be in the moment. But do I really want to uh, get back on a monthly Batman comic or do I want to just wait and read it digitally or in a graphic novel when it all comes out? Uh, I can't decide. But I was unable to get the regular copy, which was five bucks, and I had to get this uh, cardstock copy for six bucks. And both those prices are pretty upsetting to me. Um, and I, I, pr I wish I had looked around at some other shops. My shop was sold out on this, or maybe he didn't... I, I bet the shop owner at my shop didn't even know that a new hot writer was starting on Detective. So he didn't know to order any more copies than the previous issue. Anyway, it was sold out. And then I went to another shop, and all that was left was two of these cardstock ones. So I thought, well, I better get it. But I really... It does... 
create a dent in my enjoyment of reading when I feel like I've way overpaid for a comic. There's also a very interesting um, backup story written by Simon Spurrier and with incredible art and coloring. Incredible art by Danny and coloring by Dave Stewart. I lo it was a visual treat. I had a little trouble buying into a Gordon with these alcohol issues and I don't know. I feel like Gordon should come off a bit tougher than he does here. Um, I do understand it's kind of an interesting storyline to look at sort of a man of action and power who suddenly is retired and has no position in life anymore. Um, gorgeous art, though. So I'm going to be sorely tempted to continue with this, especially if I can find um, the cheaper $5 copy. Ah, that's painful. Three ninety nine is enough. Four dollars is enough for a comic, man. Okay, so it probably it helped with my number three that it was not an overpriced comic. It was just the regular four dollars, which I bought it at my shop. So I actually paid three dollars for it with my twenty five percent discount. This was really fun. It was written by Al Ewing, and I'm a little nervous when now when I see something written by Al Ewing. But uh, so far, this issue was really. F fun, uh, particularly lifted up by the art by um, Tom Riley, who seems to be like in that um, uh, Steve Lieber school of art. And I really got strong um, retro Don Heck vibes here. It's kind of funny because poor Don Heck was not appreciated in his time at Marvel. But now I'm all excited to see uh, someone sort of do a Don Heck like comic. <laughs> Um, how many readers, current readers of Marvel care about a retro Don Heck comic? I don't know. But this was a lot of fun. And I guess it's kind of a one shot. And then the next issue will have, I believe, a different artist. And do they have a preview of it? A different artist and a different feature, a different Ant Man. So I guess, is this an anniversary of Ant Man or something? So there, it's kind of a clever idea on an anniversary to look at all the different versions of Ant-Man. I'd love it if they did Yellow Jacket and Giant Man and whatever other things Hamp Pym has done, but I think they're just going to focus on various people who've taken up the Ant-Man uh, mantle. Okay, so now to my top two. They really are both number ones in my mind. They're so different from each other, and I couldn't really decide, but... In the margins, I decide to make a righteous thirst for vengeance. The penultimate issue, I believe, number 10, uh, make this my number two. Um, if I were to kind of add up all that's come before, it's hard not to make it my number one. But my number one, which is a number one issue, seems to imply an incredible potential in its future issues, too. So it's kind of the excitement of the past issues versus the excitement of the future issues. But, uh, and I kind of notice now that, at least in the last three or four issues, each issue of A Righteous Thirst for Vengeance, even though it's part of a sequence of events, some of which haven't been fully explained to us yet, and so that rests, a lot rests on that final issue, I think. Um, but each issue has a different tone, even though it's by the you know, same artist and colorist and everything. So, um, you know, we had a horrific issue, then we had a very peaceful, gentle issue, and now we have a slam-bam action issue, uh, you know, which you could almost imagine uh, Bruce Willis in the starring role here, even though he looks nothing like the, uh, the character. But anyway, uh, a lot of fun, incredible art. Artists are so important on comics, and we are so lucky when we get incredible artists like this. Um, incredible artists like uh, the artists in this Batman. It makes so much difference, and the artists should get so much credit. Uh, Andre Lima Araujo, probably mispronounced by me here. Um, ALA. Um, I'm, as, as this ends, I am going to be dying to see what ALA does next. So, um, But I think that Rick Remender really... Well, we'll have to see with the final issue. But Rick Remender, I think, really 
uh, got this artist. He and this artist are working together so well. And um, hopefully the next writer that ALA works with will also be able to work with him as well as Rick Remender. So finally, I put in at number one, Superman Space Age, written by Mark Russell, art by Michael Allred, art, uh, color by Laura Allred. Uh, and as I said, I, I was on uh, Robbie's channel this past Friday talking about the best comics of the month. And I, I said, you know, every sort of mini generation of comics, like every five to ten years, comes a new really big special Superman story, like uh, All-Star Superman or Superman for All Seasons and that sort of thing. And this looks like it's going to be that kind of comic, too. It also feels very much for people into Superman lore, into DC lore. I also It's not a, like it, but it also feels to me kind of like... Uh, um, what's the famous Darwin Kick Cook? Uh, the... Uh, ah! Brain fart. Super brain fart. The famous Darwin Cook Justice League book. Uh, anyway, it has that vibe to me, too, in terms of a big sweeping story that ties in, even though it's kind of an Elseworlds, ties in to the whole huge mythos of DC and their superheroes. And uh, I, I was impressed by so many different details here. Uh, it was a chunky read. It took me a while. It took me several sittings to keep plugging through this. And that would... That, that and a little bit of complaints, me and the coloring. I'm always complaining about coloring. I felt like Laura Allred uses too many grays. And uh, usually that's fine, you know, in a Michael Allred comic, but it didn't sit well with me with this sort of 60s space age kind of thing. It was, her coloring was quite good throughout, but um, just too often I felt found myself looking at sort of a gray wall in the background. Why are all the walls gray? Um, that's me being picky, but I can't help it. I've started to think that color in a comic book, you know, I'm talking about how important the art is. Color can be 20 to 50% of what makes the art work in my mind now, um, as I've developed my thinking about coloring and my, my enjoyment of the comic. Uh, that was not the case in old comics where there was sort of almost a, a standard level of coloring and it usually didn't go much above or much below that but now with so many options um, coloring can make a comic book such a joy you know like that Batman detective comics to read and it can ruin a comic um, anyway I've said that kind of stuff too many times uh, as pointed out I, I can't remember who on Robbie's show pointed out might have been Robbie uh, it was fantastic the way we got these backstories on both Clark's father and Lois's father and their wartime experiences in World War II. And it really is important to understand how much World War II was an influence on the Silver Age of comics, both on the creators and the whole vibe, the, the lightness of the Silver Age even, and the darkness lying underneath, all come from a response to the end of World War II and the experience of so many adults uh, at that time was in some one way or another influenced by World War II. My parents were kids during World War II, but you know, there's a huge influence on my family uh, from the Nazis because my mom's family had to escape the Nazis, flee through Belgium, flee through France, then move to Switzerland, and then after the war, uh, move from Switzerland to the United States um, and all kinds of traumatic things, although not as traumatic as the people who actually got caught and sent to concentration camps happened to them. I love the um, all the retro nods. feels like there's a lot of nods to the uh, to the lore that came from the Superman movie too. Um, so it feels like uh, <clears throat> Mark Russell, who maybe originally when he started in comics wasn't like that big of a comic book person, has really plunged himself deep into the world of Superman and perhaps into the world of uh, the Crisis on Infinite Worlds 
uh, what was leading up into that and what that was all about, because that ties in here too. So it's definitely a, a comic with full of Easter eggs for comic book fans. So uh, well-deserved number one. I've now talked myself into, I don't know, I don't want to... I don't want to lessen my love for, for the righteous thirst for vengeance. So let me quickly... Oh, another comic I read, not that I'm going to rank it at all, was Dagar the Invincible number 11. Uh, I, I enjoy these painted covers now in Gold Key. As a kid, it was so disappointing to see the painting and then go to the art inside. I don't know, though, if I ever read Dagar as a kid because it's a pretty good... Conan ripoff, if you will. It's, you know, it's got good art. It's got some interesting stories. There's a sense of the art and the script kind of, you know, I think this was a Spanish artist and someone was writing it quickly for Gold Key in the United States and then they'd send the script to Spain. And uh, there, there's a certain maybe lack of uh, oomph there because of the the script and the art not coinciding. Um, but it's pretty good. There, there isn't a credit for the artist here, and I used to know the name of this artist, and I'll, I'll figure it out later. Um, but he drew, I think, all of the Dagar. And I, I think a lot of it was written by Don Glutt, but I might be wrong. Um, but it's primarily the art that I'm really enjoying here. Uh, so I'm going to be reading some more Dagar the Invincible. I have a bunch that I've collected but not gotten around to reading so um drawn and quarterly had a sale and a couple of people on twitter alerted me to that and i went over and it was hard to choose hard to limit myself but i did limit myself but i actually got quite a few books i got this one sort of sight unseen just because i like the cover and i guess with the sale price it was pretty cheap I think it was a 50% off sale, Art Comics by Matthew Thurber. I love the colors and the look of this cover. Uh, flipping through it, the colors don't quite have the same effect on the inside. Uh, some people on Twitter, now that I've posted on Twitter, told me it's not one of their favorites, and some other people have told me it's, uh, that this artist has done some masterpieces, and this is one of them. So we'll see what I think as I go through it. Um, it's pretty hefty. There's quite a lot to read here. And then, um, kind of Jared Osborne's fault. I, this is very early Gasoline Alley comics. I don't know if it was called Gasoline Alley at the time. Walt before Skizix. I think Skizix is his son, if I'm right. And this is a very just interesting little volume. Oh, look, there's a comic strip on the inside. And so I think we're looking at stuff from very early in the 20th century. It feels a bit like a, uh, a window into time. And I guess some of the strips were just a one panel. Oh, that's weird. I'm, I'm going to have to figure this out. It says July 27th, then it says August 3rd. Or maybe there was a weekend in between. But then August 10th, August 24th. What's going on here? So some of them are one panels, and then we start getting multiple panels. So anyway, I'll have to read this and figure it all out. Um, but I, I have a feeling it's a window into kind of a regular lower middle class life, perhaps, or middle class life back at the uh, early part of the 20th century when cars were just becoming a thing in Gasoline Alley. Um, so either thanks, probably thanks to to Jared Osborne for uh, always talking about that and making me want to get it. And then I've always wanted to read more of Aileen Kaminsky Crum, uh, but never kind of pulled the trigger. Uh, but with a half-off price, it was too tempting. I'm not a huge fan of her art style, and, and I think she's almost entirely, if not entirely, autobiographical comics, which is kind of a bit lower on my priority list than, than things with more of a fictional, fictional aspect to them. But I've always wanted to, to dive deeper into her. I generally have the impression she has a pretty unique voice. And perhaps being married to Crumb, both Robert Crumb, both makes her more well-known, but also makes people not look at her for herself. So um, I've often 
read stuff where she's kind of jamming with Robert Crumb together, but I always wanted to try reading just pure Aileen Kaminsky or Aileen Kaminsky Crumb. And then finally I got, uh, from the, this sale, I got two books from Daniel Close, Klaus, Close, who, th- which I have read maybe 15 years ago or more uh, from out of the library. And I remember particularly liking Death Ray. I don't, re- maybe I didn't like Wilson that much. I can't remember because I haven't, I don't remember much about it. So anyway, I thought that I want to have all the Dan Klaus I can get in hardback in my collection. So these seemed like really nice hardbacks. <clears throat> One more thing. Actually, a little while ago, I saw that this um, artist edition from Frank Thorne was uh, at a reduced price on in stock trades. So I went ahead and purchased that because I'd actually keep uh, on heritage art auctions, I keep bidding and losing on Frank Thorne pages. I, I have a fascination for his artwork. I am not sure, but I feel like maybe the reproduction in here isn't quite as good as in IDW volumes. This is from Dynamite, who I guess owns the Red Sonia license. Um, But maybe it's just the nature of what the actual pages look like. I don't know. Or is it that they didn't take quite as sharp a, uh, uh, quite as high resolution or sharp a picture of the art as IDW does or something in the printing process or maybe it's just my imagination but I I just got this in the mail too it came in a box like three times the size of this book loaded in plastic wrapping it was pretty bizarre my wife thought I had bought an even bigger book than I ever have but this is actually amongst the artist editions a, a modest sized one so um Maybe someday I'll do a, an overview of all the artist editions I've collected by now. That's a, it's a lot. Anyway, uh, so comic addicted as always. I will talk to you all soon.